2004 under a memorandum of understanding with the Department of Science and Technology. In the first one or two years, there were reports saying that this is something which is unthinkable, that you are giving a professor an equipment which is expensive and he is giving 60% of it to outsiders. So a sharing philosophy. The basic mandate behind the entire facility Hello and good evening to everyone. On behalf of the Office of Global Engagement, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the 20th webinar from the IRS webinar series. My name is Richu George Phillip and I'm a part of the Office of Global Engagement. From the Advanced Materials Technology Cluster, the research initiative presenting today is Mechanics and Applications of Responsive Soft Matter, led by Professor Krishna Kanan. The main goals of this research initiative are to predict the growth and rupture of aneurysms using deep learning that quantifies risk factors and to develop tunable and programmable lab on a chip device by using responsible, responsive polymers that eliminate the need for an external pump. Professor Krishna received his PhD in 2004 from Texas A&M University in Mechanical Engineering. His current research interests include mechanics of filled elastomers, development of thermodynamical frameworks for additive manufacturing and chemically reacting polymers and constitutive modeling of soft biological matter. He also works closely with the tire industry. Joining us as a speaker today is Professor Ratna Kumar Anabatula. Professor Ratna works in stimuli responsive systems, granular mechanics and coupled problems in mechanics. He develops computational models to simulate the complex deformations in stimuli responsive systems, such as photoresponsive liquid crystal thin films and solvent responsive polymer films. He also works in granular mechanics, wherein his work focuses on understanding the thermomechanical responsive response of granular systems with applications in energy, additive manufacturing, agriculture machinery design, and process optimization for the pharmaceutical industry. Joining us as the moderator today is Professor Sin Young Baek. Professor Baek is an associate professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at Michigan State University. His research interests lie in cardiovascular mechanics, cell mechanobiology, and developing novel clinical interventions that utilizes various theoretical and numerical methods, constitutive modeling, and cardiovascular biofluid solid modeling, and physics-based machine learning. Thank you for joining us today, Professor Baik. We're very excited that you could be a part of the webinar today. Also with us on the panel are Professor Dilip K. Satapati, Professor Narasimhan Swaminathan, Professor Parag Ravindran, Professor Pijush Ghosh, and Professor Sundararajan Natarajan. A warm welcome to all of you. And before we start, a note to the participants. Please use the Q&A to enter your questions and upload questions that interest you so that the moderator can prioritize them later. Over to you, Professor Krishna. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Richu, for a you know nice introduction. So let me uh, first welcome uh, you know all of uh, you who have joined live here today. There are about four hundred, I can see the participants. So we'll uh, jump right to it. So by soft matter, we mean uh, you know material that is easily deformed. Okay, in comparison with uh, hard materials like metals and ceramics. Okay, and by responsive soft matter, we mean the matter, uh, you know, there is a, a deformation in the matter that is caused by a stimuli, which is other than a mechanical force. It could be, for example, light or heat, okay? So, uh, yeah. So the goals of this uh, laboratory is uh, divided, you can see that between the two verticals, the vertical uh, one, deals with the living matter, vertical two on smart, uh, smart polymers. So the goal, as far as the vertical one is concerned, is to accurately predict the growth and rupture of an abdominal aortic aneurysm. And you can see here in the picture, so uh, you have, you know, sometimes degenerative changes occur on the arterial wall, which causes the wall to balloon uh, by uh, balloon and we call that as an aneurysm. And the rupturing of that aneurysm uh, is nearly fatal, okay? So for the vertical two, 
the idea is to you know develop the next generation lab on a chip device that is both programmable and tunable. Okay. By lab on a chip device, we mean integrating a laboratory function onto a chip. And by a programmable device, we mean that device should be able to do more than one laboratory function. The same chip will be able to do more than one laboratory function. And by tunable, we mean we can adjust the response time of this chip so that you can do a wide variety of, you know, wider variety of laboratory function using the same device. So I will now focus on the uh, vertical number one, which is to accurately predict the growth and rupture of an abdominal aortic aneurysm. The mortality race, uh, risk associated with the ruptured aneurysm is at least, you can see that it's at least 80%. And the prevalence rates in India is about 1.8 million men and women have this condition at any given time. And the incidence rates, that is the number of new cases that are added is almost uh, amounting to about 100,000 on an annual basis. Okay, so that's the rate of incidence. The current clinical practice, as far as the uh, predicting when to, or, uh, predicting the growth or even you know, when to intervene has to do with the size of the aneurysm. It's purely geometric. So if the size of the aneurysm is 55 millimeters or larger in the case of a man, and 50 millimeter or larger in the case of women, or if it is symptomatic, then a cardiologist, interventional cardiologist or a vascular surgeon will uh, you know, recommend uh, uh, either a surgical repair or, or more recently an endovascular aneurysm repair, uh, repair, which is a stent, which is inserted. You can see in the picture here. So this is the stent which is inserted and this is the aneurysm, what you're seeing and the blood flows through the stent rather than on the uh, rather than on the, uh, you know, touch the tissue itself, causing the uh, risk of rupture to be reduced. So this is a more recent treatment. So there are other clinical, uh, you know, uh, approaches based on the rate of the growth of the aneurysm is used on, you know, deciding when to intervene for that. So uh, if we look at the, uh, so this current clinical approach is based on a, a heuristic based approach. Uh, and uh, we can look at the data, uh, you know, to figure out how good the current heuristic based approach is. So if you look at the United States preventive uh, uh, task force, 2019 data for the size of the aneurysm between 50 to 59 millimeters, one in 10 patients develop a ruptured aneurysm or the accuracy is about 10%, roughly about 10%. More interestingly, uh, you know, for the sizes that are smaller than the current clinically accepted uh, uh, size of 55 millimeters, 32, so 55 is the, uh, you know, size recommended for surgical intervention. For the sizes which are much smaller than that, about 4% of the patients do develop uh, such a ruptured aneurysm. So, uh, so that is something of a, you know, little bit of a concern as well. So, to summarize, the current heuristic-based approach, uh, you know, is inaccurate, and uh, you know, mainly because uh, it is not patient-specific. So, what is the way forward? Would be to look at, uh, you know, we need to have some sort of a quantitative models which can predict the growth and eventual rupture of an aneurysm. So that is the. So we have to come up with some sort of a quantitative techniques as opposed to a heuristic based approach. So the main problem, what we are trying to solve as regarding the uh, you know, prediction of the growth and rupture is the accuracy problem. So which we are trying to do uh, through you know, sophisticated quantitative models, building them to predict the growth and eventual rupture of an aneurysm. So, uh, so the problem of predicting the growth and uh, rupture is not a simple problem. It's a very complicated uh, problem. It comes with its own challenges. The first, uh, you know, uh, challenge is uh, that uh, you know it is becomes very difficult uh, to have a patient-specific uh, growth and rupture prediction uh, for to make it patient-specific is not that easy. Okay, and. Uh, 
if you look at, uh, as far as what do we know about the patient, we can do an MRI image, we can get the current uh, you know, image, the geometry of the uh, aneurysm, we can get it. And we can do magnetic resonance elastography, and we can get an idea of the inhomogeneity which is there on that tissue. So that is this sort of information we can obtain as far as a given patient is concerned. But however, there are uh, you know, uh, information about the tissue response for an individual patient is largely unknown because uh, you know, we have to deform the tissue by a large amount in order to get the response. So that is not possible. So for that, we have to rely on the in vitro data uh, where uh, you know the excised tissue sample during a repair, for instance, can be used to figure out you know what sort of mechanical response we get that. So we have such data that is available, and the idea is for an individual patient, we have to quantify the uncertainty based on that in vitro data. So that has to be taken into account into the model. The second challenge would be to look at the risk factors. For instance, the use of tob uh, tobacco coronary artery disease or hyperlipidemia, all of that can contribute uh, to the growth of, uh, you know, growth of the aneurysm and eventual rupture. And in particular, smoking in India, uh, you know, that is a major risk factor as far as the growth and rupture of an aneurysm is. Uh, the, again, the challenge uh, here is how do we quantify it given that the pathogenesis of the disease is largely unknown? So uh, if you don't know the pathogenesis, we cannot build that into a quantitative physics-based model. Okay? And the idea would be here uh, to use machine learning, which relies only on the input-output uh, and use that uh, you know, to predict and quantify, quantify the risk factor in the sense of using the machine learning. That's one way out because the mechanism, the, the pathogenesis of the disease is unknown for many of these risk factors. So that is the second major challenge as far as the prediction of the growth and rupture of an aneurysm goes. So this big problem can be broken down into uh, smaller problems. And here we can see that, uh, you know, we need experts who look at the constitutive modeling of the tissue in particular. We need to, as I said, we need to quantify the uncertainty uh, in the material properties uh, that goes into these physics-based models and that we get it from in vitro studies. And uh, we have to repeatedly, so because it's, uh, these are stochastic in nature, for a given patient, we have to solve, uh, you know, the probability of rupture, you know, we have to solve the stress response in that aneurysm multiple number of times. And for that, you need a very sophisticated uh, numerical techniques uh, so that you can solve a large number of, we are talking about thousands of three dimensional simulations that needs to be done uh, perhaps for a single patient. And uh, in addition to that, we need to you know, incorporate the patient data. So uh, in the patient uh, data, we are looking at you know, groups. We have to group them into uh, you know, people with no risk factors, one risk factor at a time, two risk factors at a time, and three risk factors at a time. And the idea is, again, let's say, for, uh, uh, you know, and we have to track a number of patients in each of these groups. So a patient, let's say from risk factor one comes in, we take a, a MRI image at the beginning of the year, at the end of the year, another image is taken. So the aneurysm, let's say, has grown. So we need to know how this aneurysm has grown from point A to point B, the beginning of the year to the end of the year. And that's where the physics-based models come in. And we use the physics-based model to fill in the gaps, so to speak. And that information goes in to populate the hybrid database. And we have to develop the beta database in that manner. And then one can do uh, AI on top of it, and we can come up with an improved uh, prediction of the growth and rupture, which ultimately goes to an interventional cardiologist. And uh, you know he's the one who's going to decide based on this additional quantitative information. He's going to use that uh, in order to uh, come up with a better prognosis and you know a way to treat that problem. So uh, we are not trying to replace the uh, you know, interventional cardiologist. We are only providing information to clinicians. And uh, it's all about saving lives. The impact on the society, it's all about saving lives. It is to accurately plan. What we can get out of this is you can accurately plan the time of the intervention. 
we can understand why certain aneurysms of a smaller size, why do they fail, for instance, right? So, uh, you know, uh, with that, I'm, you know, I'm at the end of my presentation. And for the vertical number two, I invite Dr. Ratna to take over. Okay, thank you, Krishna. And uh, uh, so uh, I'll give you a brief description of uh, what we do in the vertical two, uh, the functional smart polymers group. Uh, Professor Krishna has uh, already gave you already given you an introduction about the uh, lab on a chip. So uh, let me move on. So lab on a chip device basically integrates uh, various functions that would be otherwise done in a laboratory on a single chip. However, the current uh, status of these uh, lab on a chip devices is that they need some external devices for letting the fluid flow happen on these uh, uh, devices. So that means you have an external pumping system such as syringe pumps or peristatic pumps that will control the fluid flow on these devices as, I, as shown in this schematic. So the major problem here is that they cannot be truly called as a lab on a chip device, rather they should be called as chip in a lab device. So the question that we ask ourselves is, can we actually make these devices truly a lab on a chip device, wherein we could integrate the fluid flow control systems on board the chip so that you don't have to carry additional baggage in order for these chips to work. And in order to address this problem, we would like to, we plan to use uh, stimuli responsive systems, which can aid us in uh, integrating these fluid flow, fluid flow control systems on board this lab on a chip devices. So uh, when we want to use these uh, uh, stimuli responsive systems in order to address the issues that we have seen in a conventional lab on a chip device, uh, we, uh, we confront with certain challenges as far as the uh, functional smart polymers that are actuatable by different stimulus. So the kind of stimulus that we are talking here are uh, the stimulus such as light, water, electric field, or magnetic field, or vapors. So the major issues, or major challenges when we want to realize these systems are, first of all, the to achieve the programmable and controllable actuation. What do we mean by programmable and controllable actuation? On a single chip, we should be able to get the stuff that, is, uh, that needs to be done and different kinds of uh, uh, different kinds of reactions that need to be take place on a single chip should be doable. And the second challenge in these systems is the repeatability of the actuation. So how many times can you get this actuation uh, uh, repeated without losing any of its efficiency? And at the same time, make these chips reusable so that you can reduce the medical waste as much as possible. And the third challenge, which is the most complex challenge, is to see if we can use these uh, uh, devices that can be responsive for multiple triggers, such as not only for light. For instance, in this figure here, you see a thin film that can be responsive and when it is subjected to, when it is exposed to a light source. But can you bake these things which are uh, uh, responsive to multiple triggers, such as light and water, light and vapor, and light and magnetic field, and so on. So how do we go about solving this problem? So we aim to use a, a sophisticated simulation-driven experimental approach, wherein we use uh, uh, simulation tools that are built, which can si simulate the coupled phenomena in these systems, which involve the interaction between mechanics and chemistry, mechanics and uh, uh, electric fields and mechanics and ma mechanics and magnetic fields and so on, and then try to develop this computational framework which can incorporate these coupled photochemo interactions so that we can understand the underlying physics of the system so as to uh, help the experimental process to design uh, systems that can actually lead to the required actuation uh, that is needed for these systems. And uh, here you can see in this work, we plan to develop the systems that are actuatable by different kinds of triggers, such as light, water, and web. 
so uh, through this work we hope to make these medical diagnostics accessible to even to the remote corners so the by making these uh, lab on a chip devices truly miniaturized or truly portable and another uh, way that we can see is that if these miniaturized lab on a chip devices become available uh, to a general public this can uh, potentially disrupt the way the medical diagnostics is done today wherein doing a laboratory test in a remote places is a nightmare and you need to move to a nearest city where the such facilities are available and if these kind of uh, portable devices become available we can probably influence or impact lives to a larger extent and uh, in this endeavor we have a group of faculty members who are enthusiastic in uh, achieving these goals with cross functional expertise people from mechanical engineering physics and uh, applied mechanics uh, having expertise in various aspects of these systems both biological systems and non biological systems and we are also uh, working together with uh, collaborators who are uh, well known leaders in their own field of research uh, across uh, various countries and on, also we have industry leaders which, who are willing to support us in this endeavor and as uh, any scientific research cannot be done without uh, young people in the groups and who are coming who are willing to come forward and uh, with uh, come with great ideas and we are always open uh, to invite students who can come with uh, nice ideas and uh, uh, innovative uh, ideas and we are open to welcome you in our group and with that i will close this presentation and thank you very much for your attention Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Kanan and Dr. Latana for nice presentation. Um, so for the, uh, the presentation, there is a two one. Uh, one is abdominal aneurysm and the, the functional the, uh, material. So the assessment of the, the aneurysm risk and the prediction of the aneurysm growth should be uh, critical for the, the patient management and the surgical plan. And also for the second talk in the innovation of the, the smart functional design should be uh, important for the, the medical technology for the health. So the first one is, uh, uh, um, I would like to invite the, the uh, audience for the type your know, the answer, and then uh, probably uh, we can answer in the, the one. I think uh, the first one is the, the, the question we got from the, uh, Aminesh and uh, Chiravasta, the, well, there is one of the question. How can you use uh, actuator and how can you use actuators in 2D film, uh, the uh, 2D film? So can you please explain a little bit more? Yep, uh, Professor Beck, thanks for your question. Uh, how can we, the question is, how can we uh, do the actuation in uh, 2D films? That, is that the question? Yeah, so the question. yeah. So uh, the answer is the films are uh, called thin films, although the, there will be some finite thickness, but the, uh, the thickness of the film is much, much smaller compared to length and width. In that sense, they are called 2D films, but in reality, they are three-dimensional because you will have some finite thickness. And when you have, uh, for instance, let us take the example of uh, uh, solvent responsive thin films, wherein, let us say you have a thin film sitting on a water uh, pool, then uh, water can diffuse from the bottom layer into the film. And as a result, you will generate a concentration gradient. The water concentration at the bottom layer will be much higher compared to the top layer because there will be a finite amount of time that is required for the water to diffuse through the film, right? So you have, uh, by that means, you would have created a concentration gradient through the thickness of the film, which will result in some sort of eigen strain, which will cause a strain gradient through the thickness. And that strain gradient through the thickness is what gives the actuation that you would see in these films. Similarly, if you consider uh, the light responsive films, 
the mechanism will be a little different, but you will uh, create a strain gradient through the thickness is the key. And once you create a strain gradient, you will be able to generate a bending deformation as you have seen in those animations. I hope uh, that answers your question. Yeah, thank you for your nice uh, the, the, the explanation. Um, actually, this is the, the successive or uh, the another the, the question is, so uh, I think related to the one. So this is the, the question is uh, how we uh, find the relation between the, the physical and chemical input and the mechanical output of this uh, responsive the material. So I, I think this uh, the, this problem is uh, the, the challenging uh, because you have the, the complexity, you have material, and also you have the, the chemical and geometry. So might be this is uh, the you know uh, it will be helpful for the audience uh, if you explain more detail. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you very much uh, for this question. This is a very interesting question. And of course, this is the one of the key challenges in realizing the uh, uh, actuation in these systems, right? So the chemical inputs, uh, for instance, if you take into, uh, take the consider uh, take into account of uh, the light responsive systems, you need to have a specific uh, set of molecules which can be actuated by light, right? So they are responsive to light. When light is shown on those materials, they actually change from one specific state uh, to another state. Uh, they, they sort of do an isomerization. Uh, through this isomerization state, they will change their uh, energy state and which results in, uh, in uh, which results inside the material, a, uh, uh, strain gradient through the thickness, and that is what uh, causes the bending. So uh, the key thing is one needs to identify what kind of molecules that one needs to use in order to create this light actuation or photo actuation. Similarly, when you are coming, when you are going to use uh, uh, the water responsive or uh, solvent responsive thin films, you need to see what kind of uh, uh, materials, polymers that one can use which will be able to accommodate. That means, first of all, the polymer should be able to take the water in. That means what the water should be diffusing through the polymer. So these are the kind of things what one needs to consider before we uh, go about uh, developing these uh, actuators, right? I hope uh, that sort of answers your question if it is not uh, complete. Yeah, I think this is the nice uh, the, the answer. Yeah, thank you. And there is one of the, the, the question from the, the topic in abdominal attic aneurysm is about uh, where. So this is for the, uh, the machine learning. Uh, this one. So uh, so there is one of the question about uh, the abdominal aneurysm, why we are using the, the machine learning. So this is the model, just uh, the or the training, so then we can decide that that'll be the, the question. I think the the, uh, the presentation, uh, there is the two of the, you suggest two of the solutions. So one is uh, quantifying one of the uncertainty. So one of the, the you, you give the training, so then how do you uh, uh, quantify some of the uncertainty and also how do you use the, the machine learning? So uh, Dr. Krishna, can you a little bit uh, explain about more detail? Sure. Uh, yeah. So as far as the machine learning goes, uh, you know, we were, we were discussing the risk factors, right? So the risk, as far as the risk factor goes, uh, many times we do not know all the mechanisms that are involved. We don't know the mechanistic pathways that are uh, involved, uh, you know, before that. So that, or to put in other words, the pathogenesis of that disease is unknown. For instance, a smoker, we know that smoking increases the risk of the rupture, but we do not know all the mechanisms that are responsible uh, to, you know, which will ultimately lead to the rupture of an aneurysm. So in cases like that, it's very hard for us to go for physics-based models. And uh, we have to use uh, this sort of mission learning to figure out what is the re relation input and output relation alone you try to figure out because we just don't know all the mechanisms that are involved. Therefore, uh, we cannot do any physics-based uh, modeling as far as that particular uh, thing is concerned. So we have two aspects. One is the risk factor, which is very hard uh, you know, to do a physics-based model, mostly because the, as I said, the pathways, uh, the mechanistic pathways are unknown or is it too, it's too complex. 
The other thing is we do not know certain information about a patient. Mm -hmm. So for instance, the large scale, the large deformation of a, you know, uh, of a uh, aneurysmal tissue, for instance, or an aortic tissue is unknown. So we cannot know that. So all we, we can get some idea on the small deformation of the tissue through magnetic resonance elastography. That gives you some idea of the uh, you know, stiffness associated with the tissue. But however, for these models, we need a larger deformation. And uh, that information is unknown. So we have to rely on in vitro data. So that is uh, you know, data where they might have done an aneurysm repair, harvested the tissue, we do the experiment, get the information. So such information is available. And uh, you know, that is going to have a distribution. You kind of have a wide variety of response even there. So put in other words, we need to somehow incorporate this information into the patient uh, you know, when we're trying to go for a patient specific prediction. So we have to incorporate that. The way to incorporate it is through uncertainty quantification. So we have to quantify this uncertainty and that will reflect in a physics-based model as some sort of a distribution of the material properties. So that we can get, and there are techniques like Bayesian techniques we can use to get the right uh, distribution of each of the material properties associated with the uh, physics-based models that predict how the aneurysm grows and ruptures. Yeah, thank you for the thoughtful the, the answer. So this is the, the one. Uh, there is a, uh, one of the, the questions about uh, the functional the one. So Thor, about uh, your answer that asmorization asmo uh, causes a strain uh, gradient and then bending for the light responsive materials, what type of the experimentation are needed to quantify this relation? Yeah, uh, I think I'll call uh, Dr. Ratna. All right. Yeah. So first of all, uh, for these materials, you uh, will be able to, uh, when uh, if you want to measure the strain, first of all, you can use some non-contact uh, techniques, uh, optical techniques uh, to measure the deformation of the film, and then you will be able to measure the strain. That is first thing. And the second thing that if you are interested in finding out how uh, this uh, isomerization or space transformation is taking place in these liquid crystal systems, uh, we know certain, uh, for instance, uh, there are uh, certain molecules called agio based molecules, which will respond to light. And in, the, in their ground state called trans state, they are like a straight rod like molecules. They will be like straight rods. And when they are exposed to light, they go to another state, they isomerize to another state called a cis state, wherein it is a bent state. So a straight molecule becomes a bent molecule. And in this liquid crystal polymer, these rod-like mesogens or rod-like molecules are connected to your polymer chain. So because of the fact that these rod-like molecules are bending, they are uh, and they are connected to the polymer chain, they pull along the polymer chain, causing deformation in the polymer chain. So the local isomerization change from a straight rod-like structure to a bent structure is what is causing the deformation, right? And we know certain molecules which would respond to light this way. And then we add these molecules into the liquid crystal uh, network. And that allows us to create these deformations in these materials. Is that the question? Uh, is that the right, uh, the expected answer or? Yeah, I, I think, uh, yeah, this is the, the, the question about the, the specific, uh, the, the um, you know, experiment of the one. So uh, there is actually the, the uh, multiple the, the question uh, one, uh, seems to be a little bit, a little bit detailed, uh, but maybe uh, this is the, maybe we can have a little bit more uh, general the, the question for the, the, the center. So uh, maybe uh, one of the, the questions will be, uh, it will be very helpful for the, the general audience. You know, this is the, the, the center. Uh, so basically what, what is the, the, uh, the what, what is the center of the vision? Or maybe this is the, not the short term, but you know, 
at the end, at the you finish the, the center, what should be you know the long term some of the, the vision? What is the, the solution? So might be that will be very helpful for um, Dr. Krishna or Dr. Ratna. That will be very helpful for the audience. Sure, I'll I'll try to answer our long term goal for the center as far as vertical two is concerned, where functional smart poly smart polymers are concerned, and then I'll let Professor Krishna answer for the uh, aneurysm part. So the our grand goal in this uh, functional smart polymers uh, team is to be able to develop a portable lab on a chip device. Why do we say? Why do we uh, stress upon this portable lab on a chip device? Is because we don't. Uh, we want to see that the entire system is integrated on one single chip without actually having to use pumps externally. You don't want to use external pumps. The pumping system itself should be integrated on board with this chip. And when you want to do that, you also need to have fluid flow control devices. So that means today, for instance, if we want to have a chip, this is our dream. We want to have a chip. Today, we want to do a particular experiment. Tomorrow on the same chip, we want to do another experiment. So the required flow rates and the required flow paths are also different. So can we use this uh, stimuli responsive technology to achieve these goals and be able to do that on a single chip so that that can be made portable. And if that is possible, if we are able to do something like that, we can actually deploy these lab on a chip devices to remote locations where diagnostics can be done at a much faster rate and, uh, and possibly reaching all the people without having to worry about that fact that they are remotely connected to a nearest city. And that is our grand goal as far as the uh, lab on a chip uh, concept is concerned. And this we would like to achieve by adopting different stimuli response systems, not necessarily light, but we would like to see, we would like to experiment to see if we can combine multi-responsive actuation. So wherein we can combine light with water responsive or light with vapor responsive and so on, and then see how these guys interact with each other so that way, we are also going to study several fundamental issues related to these multi-responsive systems. I think that is uh, that is what is our grand goal as far as uh, the functional smart polymers uh, vertical is concerned. And I'll let my colleague uh, Krishna answer about the grand goal on uh, the first part. Thank you, Ratna. So. Uh, I mean, I, I would say the, uh, uh, the uh, big goal as far as the vertical one is concerned is we want to see uh, the way the prognosis, uh, clinically, how the prognosis with respect to the uh, growth and the rupture, we want, we want to see that change uh, you know, in a clinical setting. That's what we would like to see in the near future. And for, to, to, for that to happen, uh, we should be able to, uh, you know, we should be having this, uh, uh, you know, machine learning base, ultimately physics and machine learning uh, uh, based uh, software in place, which can accurately predict the growth and rupture of the aneurysm, right? And then later we had to go for clinical validation after it is validated, then we would like to see the landscape as far as the clinical prognosis is concerned with regard to the uh, the growth uh, and the rupture. We would I would like to see that change, and that would be the ultimate uh, goal as far as that is concerned. And uh, in this whole process, uh, you know, we're also going to set up an advisory board uh, where we're going to have experts uh, in the different uh, areas uh, connected uh, with the goals or the ultimate goals of this laboratory. Um, and you know they will guide us also. For instance, uh, you know IP generation. As far as that is concerned, we would we would like to have. Uh, we are researchers. We may not be the best people to do all that. So we're going to have an advisory board will advise us. Uh, you know how to take it uh, further. Okay. So I would say, as far as the vertical one is concerned, uh, we would like to see how the clinical prognosis is done, at least in India, to begin with, as far as the growth and rupture goes. Okay, uh, thank you for the answer. 
Uh, I think still we have some time. Uh, I, I think there is a several the question about uh, some of the, the costs and the, how you can make the, the you know the e uh, economic the, the solution or the, the material. So I, I think that'll be uh, maybe important uh, one of the, the part. And also the, the design. Also the you have to make the, the portable. So you have to you know uh, the, the device should be more cheaper and the the, the way. So might be that might be the uh, uh, you know uh, important. So can you a bit might be this is uh, the closing the, the one. So can you explain about some of the, the economic the solution, especially the the uh, smart the, the function some of the material. Okay, all right. I think uh, I would uh, again uh, uh, you know ask my colleague uh, Dr. Ratna to answer. Yes, I think that's a very important question as far as uh, making these uh, devices affordable. Right? I think at this point of time, uh, they may seem very expensive, but uh, if uh, one uh, goes through mass production and then if the technology seems feasible with the intervention of governments, uh, I think we can make them affordable by producing them in large scale. And that is only that way we will be able to reduce the cost and make it accessible to everybody. And the, the intervention of government in making these technologies accessible to everybody is one of the key uh, things, in my opinion. And, and once we show that the technology is feasible, I am sure that there will be several uh, governmental organizations would like to come forward because it is going to influence, what do you call, impact the lives of uh, people across uh, the country. Uh, irrespective of their uh, economic status or whether they are in the village, remote place or in a city. I think uh, that, is, that is the only way to go about it, in my opinion. Okay, yeah. Yeah, thank, thank you for the, the good uh, explanation. Uh, is there more to the question? Uh, so that will be one. Oh, there is another. Still, uh, uh, do you have the time? Maybe then there might be uh, one. So there is another the, the question about the please uh, through some light on the mathematical model for the growth and the remodeling of it. So I, I think this is the uh, point of the, the mathematical modeling. So might be uh, you can addressing some of the, the, the modeling. OK. Um... So, uh, so either maybe the, the growth or the uh, functional the material. Right, 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 right. Yeah. So uh, you know we should uh, for that to happen. So we are we are talking about uh, uh, constitutive models, where we take in we have to know the uh, the structure that is the structure of the artery. For instance, there are collagen fibers in it. So we have to take that into account. So the anisotropy of the material that has to be taken into account. And uh, these are responsive materials, right? So as a result of, let's say, uh, hypertension, these things remodel. So the aneurysm grows, they remodel. There are structural changes that happen inside that. So we should have models which take that also into account. Or these are called, uh, you know, models that predict the growth and remodeling. So that we, we have to take that into account. That, is, that can be done. Uh, using appropriate uh, uh, models, uh, which are connected with the growth and remodeling. Now, we, as I said, we also have to look at the anisotropy of the tissue. Another very important factor would be the inhomogeneity associated with uh, you know, these uh, tissues. And as I said earlier, so to get information like that in the, you know, as far as a given patient is concerned, we can rely on something uh, called the magnetic resonance elastography. Uh, which can give us an idea of uh, the stiffness, local stiffness. So it will give a color picture of that entire aneurysmal tissue uh, and we'll know the stiffness at different locations. So that information also can be taken into a model to build what is called the uh, inhomogeneous model. So because the tissues are inhomogeneous, they are anisotropic, which why the, which what, uh, and also not only that, they respond to stimuli and they remodel, they change, structural changes happen inside the material. So we need to capture all of this, uh, you know, using uh, models 
which uh, have a basis in thermodynamics. So from second law of thermodynamics and other principles in mechanics, we'll have to derive these uh, models in a consistent manner, which take into account structural changes that happen, the inhomogeneity in the material, uh, and uh, uh, you know the anisotropy. I think I mentioned anisotropy. So anisotropy, inhomogeneity, and the way it remodels. All of that have to be uh, taken into account in a consistent manner. Now, this is a complex problem. Again, we have to split it into smaller parts. So again, we will look at first initially, model the tissue as, uh, you know, just an anisotropic elastic material, large deformation of an anisotropic elastic material. So that would be a nice uh, starting point. So then we can in trying to figure out how to introduce the inhomogeneity. How can we incorporate uh, there's elastography data into that model and make it not only uh, anisotropic, also inhomogeneous. Then later, we should have a model also track how this uh, no matter, how this uh, tissue changes structurally over time, right? And that is a, uh, you know, that is another hard problem. So we'll have to break it down into multiple pieces and we'll have to build it in you know, pieces and all put it together at the end. So um, I think that's, uh, that's the way you have to look at it because you try everything in one shot, it may be very difficult, uh, very difficult to achieve because of the complexity of the problem. Yeah, I think this is the, the, the good uh, answer. So I think maybe uh, Podo, you are uh, uh, suggesting one of the, you know, training the, the mode. So you use a uh, physics-based uh, physics model so then uh, you are uh, prediction of the, the energy growth and the, the rupture. But I think the, the, the question is uh, related to about the data. So basically using the, the physical model, so then you are taking the actual the, the, the sample, so the, the patient and yeah. one. I think this one is should be might be another the question, how you can obtain those data. I think this is the, the way the collaboration or some of the, the hospital. So maybe you, you can, uh, this is the, the part that you can mention. Uh, right, you know. right. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, uh, so for, uh, for that to happen, uh, you know, we have to sign MOUs with uh, hospitals, uh, you know, uh, various hospitals, which do this type of routine screening. For example, uh, uh, there is a hospital in Bangalore, Narayana Hridalia, which will, uh, you know, which they do this sort of uh, screening. So that will be a good place to have a sign up an MOU with them, uh, you know, so that we can actually uh, get, uh, and that's one of the places where most of the repair also happens, aneurysm, uh, you know, repair. So those are the kind of Hospitals, Chitra Thirunal is another one, uh, you know, where they look at this sort of problem. So signing up MOU from uh, with them to get that sort of relevant information, for instance, you know, and I think that's where we can uh, possibly get uh, patients with different risk factor grouping and uh, also a way of tracking. So the hospital can, you know, do that. It will be very hard for, uh, you know, uh, a center to do it. We'll not be able to do it. So the uh, signing of an MOU with them and uh, no, they can get that sort of patient specific uh, data, what we are looking for. Sorry, maybe I, I want to read this one. Uh... So, um, oh, so there is a, uh, one of the question about the smart uh, materials. So if we consider the same for the same for other stimuli, we may able to find, find out the final response due to different the stimuli by combining those uh, the response. 
So I, I think that might be the, the design, the, the perspective, or uh, maybe you can uh, try to explain because there might be different the solution. Uh, you have different uh, stimuli or the, the design. So might be, I think this is maybe concern of the, the optimization. So design, the improving the ones. So might be uh, an answer in this, this way. Dr. Latna? Yeah, uh, Professor Baik, uh, can you say the question again? Because I missed on uh, the, uh, the first part. Uh, they want to, uh, the question is about using so, two stimuli or? Uh, so there the, the question is, the, uh, you have a multiple different stimuli. Yeah. So that uh, when you, uh, you know, the target, the, the response, so that maybe you can combine together so this stimuli and that stimuli, yep. so that combination, so that achieved some of the goals. So might be uh, okay. that is the question. Yeah. So uh, uh, it is uh, uh, it's a good question. And of course, uh, the uh, person who has asked the question is actually uh, uh, pointing to the right direction. So if we use uh, multiple stimuli, it is possible to influence the actuation rates. OK, that is one of the key parameters when we want to develop a product. However, there are several uh, fundamental issues when we want to use multi-responsive systems. First of all, uh, the one key issue is the compatibility. So if you want to have a water responsive plus light responsive system, for example, for the sake of argument, then you need to ensure that the polymer that you are using for water responsive can also accommodate the light responsive systems and the light uh, there is not enough uh, uh, loss of light. So the light attenuation should not be so great that the, some of the uh, mesogens which are required to get this light source may not get it, right? So the compatibility is a major issue. And the second thing is the mechanical integrity because these are all, we are going to use them as actuators. So you need to ensure that their life is good enough when we are using uh, uh, higher actuation at higher actuation rates their fatigue life is also another important aspect that one needs to study. And uh, there is a lot of research that is going on in order to study the fatigue response of these hydrogels, like water response systems. But there is very little work in uh, terms of uh, understanding the fatigue life for these light response systems. But when you combine them, you are going to have interaction of three different phenomena, right? So the chemomechanical phenomena coming from the hydrogel part, the photomechanical phenomena coming from the light part. But again, there is uh, the stress interactions which might, which might actually alter the response from the light source, uh, from the light uh, responsive molecules and water responsive system. So the, in that sense, it is uh, using multiple trigger is good uh, for improving the actuation rate, but it comes with several challenges. And we are uh, aware of these challenges and we would like to see what we can do about understanding the physics of these systems and then be able to develop these multi-responsive systems. And that is actually one of the main goals of this center. Okay, yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, there is another the following the, the, the question. Uh, this is about the response. So when you have the light sensor, so the, the question is how, fa how fast, you know, how, how long it takes the time. So uh -huh. this is the one of the, the, the question. Uh, so maybe, uh, Sure. You know, sure. the level of the response, so that will be, I can mention, uh, this is the part. Uh, it really depends on the kind of molecules that we use. So there are molecules which respond uh, 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 within about a few seconds. And there are molecules which actually respond uh, for quite some time. It may take a minute or so. So it really depends on the kind of molecule that we are using. And uh, certain molecules that are responsive, uh, that, are, that have a very quick response, uh, may actually respond to a light of specific wavelength. It is possible that that specific wavelength might not be suitable for our application. So we really need to look into the material systems and then see, choose a, a molecule that uh, is responsive at a specific light wavelength, right? Mm -hmm. Electromagnetic wavelength that is suitable for our application. And at the same time, it responds within uh, a meaningful amount of time. You don't want to have an actuator which when you shine light after one hour, it actuates. So something like that you don't want, right? So uh, there are challenges, but you have molecules which can respond in, uh, the response time can be a few seconds. 
or uh, less than a second but there are also molecules which who, for whose uh, for uh, for which the response time is pretty large okay yeah thank you yeah um so there is another the question about i think this is the optimal it aneurysm so because the, the physical model is the the, the solid but uh, one of the question is uh, is it possible you can use more biological cell? So maybe more incorporate the, the response in the, the cell. So maybe that can be the, the uh, mention, you know, this is the, the, the model more physical. So is it the, the extending more the biological model? Yeah, so uh, as far as the, uh, the remodeling part is concerned, so that's what we were talking about, the mechanistic uh, pathway, right? So if we know that, what is causing that, uh, you know, remodeling trigger and all that, we'll be able to incorporate that into a physics-based model. So we'll have to look at uh, the details of, uh, you know, what is causing, what is causing to precipitate such a remodeling uh, in the tissue. So that's what we need to, if that information is available, we can incorporate uh, that into a, for the uh, physics-based, on the remodeling side of it, we'll be able to incorporate that. Yeah, also maybe the, the uh, one of the, the trend because a lot of the model uh, multi-scale so that, you know, some of the organ level, the, the cell level, so that will be uh, combined together. So I, I think this is the, the ongoing developing the, the model so for the, the multi-scale to the one. So uh, that still, uh, I think that this one is exploding. So the, the idea uh, still, I think one of the few of the, the year, the, the, you know, working on the, the problem. So I think that might be later, uh, we try to see uh, what, what will be the solution. So this is the one uh, question related right. to, uh, to the answer. Yeah, uh, this is, uh, the question is on that multi-scale modeling part, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah you know, yeah. The, the level of the model in the, the cell, I, I think that will be one of the, the active. Uh, well, I mean, uh, when I, I, yeah, right now, uh, what we are looking at uh, is as far as the rupture uh, is concerned, uh, uh, it's going to be a strong function of uh, the inhomogeneity that we see in the material. So, uh, because it's not a homogeneous material, it's going to be inhomogeneous. There is going to be regions which are stiffer, other regions which are softer, and the regions in between may undergo very large local deformation. So, that would be one cause of... Uh, uh, you know, concern. And uh, we are trying to incorporate that because that would play a major role uh, in the uh, rupture, as far as the rupture goes. Uh, yes, so another, uh, yes, another direction what we can probably look at is that, uh, as you uh, brought it up, the multi-scale. So we'll have to look at uh, how the tissue is behaving, behaving at different levels, right? So we can look at, at the media, adventitia, intima, that level is one level we can go in and then we can go in deeper within each of that uh, uh, you know layer so that's the multi uh, scale effort uh, yeah that is another way to uh, look at and possibly uh, you know going in at multi uh, multiple scales uh, possibly can give us an idea of uh, why certain tissues rupture and why certain things don't so yes, so that could be one uh, methodology, uh, you know, one could uh, one could try. Yeah, yeah. So there will be, uh, you know, some of the exploding, some of the idea. Yeah. So I think this is the, maybe a little bit of time is uh, closing. Um, I think that the India is estimated about uh, about two out, out of the hundred in population. This is one of the, the shoes of population. So this is the, you know, the, the scary, some of the, the events. So I think that will be the helpful for the, the patient. And also the, the functional, the technology will be important for, uh, you know, improving the design. So I, I think that both of the, the center, uh, this goal should be very high, you know, very significant for the individual the patient, the public health. So uh, I think the, the uh, I, I uh, thank you for your, you know, good, uh, the soulful the, the explanation. So uh, I think also the uh, also thank you thank you for the, the Dr. Krishna and also Dr. Latina for you know uh, explanation. I, I also wish for your your success for the, the center. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you, uh, Professor Bay. Yeah.
Thank you, Professor Big. Thank you, Professor Krishna. Uh, Professor Krishna, would you like to announce the answers on the for the poll? Uh, yeah, uh, poll. Uh, uh, Dr. Paran. Yeah, sorry, I I didn't uh, see the poll questions. I was not. Uh, I wasn't paying attention to that. Sorry. One was on the risks risk factors for what was that? Right. I think the. Uh, yeah. Uh, Richu, we have already yeah. sent the uh, poll is this year, huh? yeah. yeah. Right. So we have already uh, sent the answers. Maybe I think you can, uh, Richu. Is that possible to put it up all the answers for the poll? Um, let me just get it. Yes. Yeah. So for the first question, the answer is option A. Uh, is that right? Which among the about thirty percent of the right? Uh, oh. And for the second question, the answer is option D. Yeah. Which 37% have gotten right. Right, yeah. For the third question, the option is answer C. Which surprisingly nearly 17% got right. Okay. And the fourth one, the answer is option B. Which the majority did get right. Yeah. So all right, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, you know uh, 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 for organizing this uh, poll event uh, and also you know take care of the polls. Thank you, thank you, Professor Krishna. Thank you, Professor Vaik, and thanks to the entire panel for joining us today. You've spent a lot of time answering so many questions from the audience, and I'm sure everyone really benefited out of your webinar. Uh, thanks, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We do have another webinar at 6.30. Uh, please um, log in for that one as well. Thanks, everyone. See you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, yeah, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah.